Welcome back to The Dive. If you're not going to hold Bitcoin for 10 years, you probably shouldn't buy it for 10 minutes, in my opinion. He'll discuss how he moved from being a skeptic to being an advocate of Bitcoin, his opinions on the direct link of current events to Bitcoin price movement, why Bitcoin should be the next commodity asset that you should own, MicroStrategy's legacy as a software company, and his own Bitcoin holdings. He is the founder and principal shareholder of MicroStrategy. Michael Saylor is joining us today. But first, consider hitting that subscribe button for me, please, so we can keep making you awesome videos. Hey, Michael, welcome to The Dive. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. OK, so from our research, at one time, you were a Bitcoin skeptic, and now you are an investor and advocate for Bitcoin. Could you walk us through what made the light go off for you to become a Bitcoin bull? Um, yeah, I think that Bitcoin is such a radical new idea that unless you have a need for the solution and you have a lot of time to spend to understand how Bitcoin works, it's easy to uh, brush it off or arm wave it off um, when you first hear about it. Um, the thing that, that caused me to embrace Bitcoin was, was uh, in March of 2020, the uh, global economy came to a grinding halt. And it was pretty clear to me that, that uh, the world wasn't going to just bounce back to the same thing that it had been 15 days later. And uh, when the Federal Reserve and the central banks of the world started to expand the money supply at a very aggressive rate, what we saw was a K-shaped recovery. Wall Street recovered very quickly within a matter of weeks. Main Street didn't recover and still hasn't recovered. And, uh, and uh, our company was sitting on top of about $500 million of capital, primarily invested in cash and credit. And when it became clear that what we had was $500 million that was going to yield 0% interest, probably for the next four years. And, uh, and it also became clear that it was going to be increasingly difficult to do business as an operating company. We had to look to other ideas. And so we discovered Bitcoin because we wanted to find a way to not see the $500 million debased away. Uh, at a 20% monetary inflation rate, then the $500 million would be cut in half in three years. And uh, so, so we had a problem in March of 2020. Uh, it became very clear. Uh, before March of 2020, for the previous decade, monetary inflation rates ran about 7% in the Western world. So it was a nagging issue, but not, um, not a mortal uh, or you know, a, a terminal disease. I think that after March of 2020, ignoring it became much more uh, difficult to do. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Okay, so do you think there's any correlation between what is happening in China with Evergrande and Bitcoin? I think that um, over the long run, no. Uh, right now, Evergrande's got a bunch of debt and they probably can't pay it all back. So, so there's, I don't know, I guess a lot of short term dislocation in the markets. But I mean, the big idea or the most important point to be made here is that that most corporations' balance sheets are composed of cash and credit, and, and cash is crumbling and credit is crumbling. Cash is losing 15 to 20% of its value every year, and, uh, and credit is like a bond. And if those bonds are yielding 2 or 3 or 4% interest, then they have a 2% default risk. And if they're, if they're losing 15% of their purchasing power every year, then you can see the negative real yields on credit are minus 15%. And the negative real yields on cash are minus 15%. So, you know, like, I think that the most important idea is that corporations would do well to actually convert their cash and credit into Bitcoin. And that's what we've done. We saw a price movement this week that coincides with ongoing concerns with Evergrande. 
Do you think there's a direct correlation between Evergrande and Bitcoin price action? Um, I, I'm not a trader. So like the, the truth is, I'm not buying Bitcoin to trade it every minute or every hour or every day. I'm buying it to hold it for a decade, between a decade and 100 years. So yeah, I, I mean, the price changes every minute and it changes every minute based upon what the Federal Reserve says or what someone, what, what the White House says or what the Chinese government says and, and the like. But I don't have a particular opinion one way or the other. And I don't think that people should really focus upon near term dislocations when they're investing in Bitcoin. If you're not going to hold Bitcoin for 10 years, you probably shouldn't buy it for 10 minutes, in my opinion, because it, will, it is volatile, right? The markets are trading 24-7, 365. And Bitcoin is plugged into the other crypto markets and the other crypto markets have huge amounts of leverage in them. So if you have lots of leverage trading with thin liquidity, it's always going to be reacting to some random news this way or that way. But, but uh, I, I, I think it would be a mistake to attempt to correlate a positive or a negative to something because that's a kind of a trader's mentality. And I think 99% of the people aren't really equipped to be traders. It's a very mm -hmm. dangerous game and induces great deals of anxiety. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, so let's talk about the regulators for a minute. Do you believe stable coins will be treated as a commodity or a security? I think they're likely to become securities. I think that the SEC has been pretty clear and they're saying that most cryptos are securities. Bitcoin is not. Bitcoin is a commodity, and it's for, it's pretty clear the consensus is Bitcoin will be will be a commodity. Uh, there are, there's speculation that there's a few other uh, crypto tokens that are commodities, but they haven't been named explicitly. The only one that's explicitly designated as a commodity is Bitcoin. I think that uh, stable coins look like uh, money market funds. Like if you give me $50 billion and I give you 50 billion in tokens, and then I invest the $50 billion into a bunch of bond instruments or credit instruments, then I'm taking risk with the 50 billion. If I were to, for example, invest the $50 billion into Evergrande bonds and the bonds were to crash by 75%, then the $50 billion of stable coins would become $15 billion or $12 billion of stable coins. And so the SEC and the regulators have a point, which is when you're buying a stable coin, you're probably you're entering into an investment contract and there is risk. And that means that you would want to know how that, uh, how that capital is invested. If I gave you 50 billion and you put it into a bank account yielding 0% interest in US dollars, that's a much less risky um, asset or balance sheet. Then if I took the same 50 billion and bought game stock, I mean, I couldn't, you know, you could do anything in between. So, yeah, um, I, I think that they will be deemed uh, as securities, especially the centralized ones. Mm -hmm. OK, all right. So we're a small cap platform and we're always trying to invest in sectors that have large tailwinds. What areas of startups related to Bitcoin are interesting to you? I think the most interesting uh, opportunities here are to plug uh, Bitcoin via the Lightning Network into payments, remittance, cybersecurity, uh, and big tech in general. If, um, if you think about Bitcoin uh, as digital energy, I take a block of a billion dollars and I convert it into Bitcoin. Um, I can move it on the base chain in a half an hour for about a dollar or two dollars. That's pretty miraculous. But the technology, that, that's primarily, it's a use case for an investor if I want to hold a bunch of money. Uh, if you actually wrap lightning around it, then I could subdivide the billion dollars into 100,000 pieces and I could move each of the pieces every second at the speed of light for nothing. So yeah. if you think about plugging money into Facebook or WhatsApp or Snapchat or Google. And uh, you, th you think about the consequences of, of using that money to provide cybersecurity or cyber payments or to serve as the base layer uh, for action. I think that's pretty compelling because 
on one hand, you've got Replace Visa and MasterCard. They charge 2.5% of the value of all money that moves on a credit card system in the world. That's huge, right? Think about what 2.5% of all the money spent on earth is. That's, does it need to be that way? No, because you can do a $37 lightning transaction for one Satoshi. One Satoshi is one two thousandth, right? <laughs> One two thousandth of a of a, like a uh, a cent or something. It's wow. ridiculously small. So I I think that the killer applications are they could be remittances because ten percent of of remittance money gets scraped off by the by the remittance providers. They could be credit card payments because two and a half percent gets uh, gets scraped off by credit card uh, payments. But they could also be just revolutionary new ideas. Like, um, you know, when you go on YouTube, you can post a comment, even though you're not a person. So if I go on your YouTube and then I criticize you, and what if I just created a robot that created 197 million fake accounts to criticize you? There's no real cost to spam, scam, denial of service, and just malicious bots in cyberspace. On the other hand, if you had to post a $20 deposit in maybe 100,000 uh, Satoshis in a Lightning wallet and plug it into YouTube or plug it into your, uh, your Yelp reviews or your Google Maps reviews or your Amazon reviews, and if, if you got caught scamming or spamming or, or being malicious and you had to pay a fine or forfeit the deposit, it would clean up all of cyberspace. So I, so I think that there, there are mega, mega applications to deliver Bitcoin via the Lightning Network to billions and billions of people. And if, you, if I was creating a company right now, I'd probably create some kind of technology or some kind of company in order to uh, deliver digital energy at the speed of light for cyber commerce or cyber security or some other kind of revolutionary application like that, that was that, that you can't do it with Western Union, you can't do it with the bar of gold, and you're not going to do it with Visa or MasterCard. They're all just too expensive, too cumbersome, and too slow to, to make sense. But with Bitcoin on a lightning network, you can do things at the speed of light a million times a second with a computer program. There's no reason why that shouldn't spread to 8 billion people on the planet and be used billions of times a day. Yeah, definitely. It's quite amazing. Okay, so let's talk about MicroStrategy. The company's legacy software business is enterprise intelligence analytics. Does this tie into Bitcoin or are there plans for MicroStrategy to at some point create software that surrounds Bitcoin? You know, we always think about these things. Um, about a year ago, we had a $500 million business growing about 0% a year and, and we had a $500 million balance sheet paying 0% interest. And then we got into Bitcoin and that $500 million balance sheet paying 0% interest became a $5 billion balance sheet growing much faster. You know, Bitcoin's growing 130% a year on average for a decade. So we all of a sudden have a very big Bitcoin business. The $500 million enterprise software business is now growing about 10% a year. So we were able to get a, get, a, get a boost on the business intelligence software business by entering Bitcoin. Uh, and I think the reason why is because it boosted our brand by a factor of 100. It, uh, it boosted our credibility with all the CXOs and all of our customers by a, a factor of 10. It was really great for employee morale and employee retention. It cut our attrition rates dramatically. And, you know, if you're an employee and you're holding stock or stock options and the stock increases by a factor of five over 12 months, then that's motivational. You know, you feel like you're winning. So it became easier for us to recruit and easier for us to retain uh, all of our talent. And, uh, and then we got this great new set of channels on Twitter and YouTube where we could get our message out uh, 100x greater, 100x cheaper. So I would say Bitcoin is a, is a benefit to the core business. It's a second order benefit. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a first order benefit to our balance sheet and our shareholders. And, and uh, the two of them are, have, have worked out well together as a complement. Mm -hmm. 
So how challenging is it to evaluate the correct timing on when to raise money and when to buy Bitcoin? Um, our view is that uh, Bitcoin is a good idea forever. It's just going to keep going up forever with some volatility. So if you focus in on the volatility, then you're going to give yourself anxiety. We, we, we um, acquire Bitcoin uh, four different ways. We acquire Bitcoin with our cash flows from our enterprise software business. So you can think of a, it as we're like a synthetic Bitcoin miner. We generate a lot of cash flow from selling business intelligence software. And mm -hmm. as we generate that cash flow, we convert it into Bitcoin. And we just do that as the cash comes available. If we have more than $50 million of cash, uh, then we're not going to invest it in, in uh, you know, a bank account yielding 0.01% interest. We're just going to buy Bitcoin with it. Mm -hmm. The second way we get Bitcoin is um, we issued uh, secured debt. Like, uh, so we issued a $500 million uh, junk bond and that yields six and an eight percent interest. So we pay six and an eight percent interest for the bond, which is a seven year bond. If you think the Bitcoin's going to go up more than six percent a year over the next seven years, then that's very accretive. You know, you, obviously all of our shareholders and we think Bitcoin will go up more than six and one eight percent interest per year. So uh, we do that and and we uh, evaluate the the debt markets continually to see whether or not we can issue more debt like that. And those rates change. The third way we buy Bitcoin is with convertible debt. So we issued one convertible note that paid 75 basis points and bought $650 million worth of Bitcoin around like 20,000 a coin. And then we issued another $1 billion, $50 million note at 0% interest. And we bought Bitcoin with that. And, uh, you know, we always evaluate the convert markets. And then the fourth way is we, uh, we issue equity. Either we, get, we issue equity because uh, employees might, issue, might convert uh, or might exercise their stock options and we get cash flow from that equity issuance. Or we can sell equity via an at-the-market shelf registration. Um, with, that, with regard to the stock options, we don't have a choice. When the employees sell the stock options, we get the cash, we buy Bitcoin. With regard to the shelf registration, well, if our stock looks like it's trading in a premium to the underlying Bitcoin that we could buy with it, then we would, uh, we would sell the stock by the Bitcoin because we're trying to drive up the number of Satoshis per share we have. If our stock is weak and Bitcoin is strong, then we wouldn't. And so we're very mm -hmm. opportunistic with regard to that. We're just considering whether or not it would be accretive to all the common stock shareholders to sell that equity. And the market is very volatile, as you know, and there are some days when it makes sense and other days when it doesn't make sense. So we're always balancing those four. The objective is just to acquire more Bitcoin. We never sell the Bitcoin. We're up to about 114,000 Bitcoin that we've acquired. I'm sure we'll buy more. Um, we'll buy more from some combination of those. There are other alternatives. We've got... We've got uh, billions of dollars of Bitcoin that is unpledged as collateral. And so in theory, we could do asset backed financings in the future of some sort, where we pledge a billion dollars of Bitcoin to borrow some money to buy more Bitcoin. Uh, we, just, we just consider what's, you know, what, what are the debt markets offering? And then does this strengthen our balance sheet or not? And we only want to do things that strengthen our balance sheet that are accretive to our shareholders. And, and uh, so it's step by step, always considering the dynamic uh, of all those things. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Okay, so in October last year, you disclosed your personal Bitcoin holdings. Do you continue to buy Bitcoin personally? Well, I, I can say that I've never sold the Bitcoin. And then from time to time, I, I consider the, the matter again. Um, but uh, I still have all that Bitcoin and I haven't made any other announcements about uh, future acquisitions of Bitcoin, but I may. Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us and uh, sharing your thoughts and expertise with us today, Michael. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning into the show today. Consider hitting that subscribe button on your way out.